my name's David Bao. And um, yeah, it's really nice to be here. Um, you know, my, I, have, I have an interesting story because uh, I was a software engineer for a long time. I used to work at Google. But a few years ago, I decided to go back to school um, because uh, it's a really interesting time in computer science. I feel like the entire field is changing. Uh, you know, machine learning is really starting to work well. And our community is uh, starting to grapple with what that means. Because really, you know, we've got these self-programming systems that are really starting to work. And it's a different type of software. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to spend a little time talking about GANs and what they're doing inside. Um, and, uh, and the theme of the talk is really um, to, to start thinking about uh, what it means when um, a piece of software is learning to do something that we've never taught it how to do. Um, so I'm getting uh, nothing here. Oh, it's fine. Let me use this. OK. Uh, oh, am I able to advance? OK, I'm not able to advance. Let's see here. Maybe I'm in single thing mode. And I'll switch this over here. It's pretty easy. OK. okay. Is this going to work? I'm not on this mode, right? OK, that's fine. OK, you, you're great. OK, great. OK, so let's talk about what a, what a uh, generative adversarial network is. So a lot of you will be familiar. But basically, um, the idea is, so the goal of a generative adversarial, adversarial network is to generate realistic output. So the, the most successful GANs uh, have been used for generating realistic images. Um, and so the, the idea is, uh, we want to train a network that, uh, that can imagine, that can imagine very realistic data. Uh, that can produce images um, uh, that look like real photographs. So what do we mean by real? Uh, so this is the main challenge with GANs, right? Um, we don't have a good definition of real other than just a lot of examples. So, for our so we'll, we'll take a data set of example real images uh, as, as our definition of what it means to be real. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, oh this one. OK, great, thanks. OK, great. Excellent. So, um, uh, so uh, it turns out that it's really easy to actually make a uh, convolutional neural network make an image. If we don't care if it's real or not, we can just stack together a lot of convolutions. Um, at the end, we can output an RGB image. And at the other end, to, um, uh, you know, we can just stick in some random data and have it processed. And in the end, we'll get some fuzzy blob out, and that'll be an image. Um, now, this is like what we would get as a starting point. But, um, but in order to get this to improve, what we really need is we need some sort of objective, some loss function, to make realistic outputs. And where do we get that? Well, it turns out it's really easy. Um, there's a trick, uh, which is uh, uh, we can actually train um, a network to solve that problem. Let me see if I can go back here. Does this work here? Switch back to my laptop. So we don't have a function that computes realism, but we can train one. Right? So here's the trick. We can just train a classifier to classify the difference between a fake image and a real image. Uh, you know, a real image will get 1 in the end, and a fake image should get 0. Uh, for training data, uh, we'll just use our samples of real data uh, for the real side. And for the fake side, we need examples of fake images. But fortunately, we have this generator that just is good at outputting really crummy images. So we'll use that as the fake data. And, um, and so we can, tell, we can train a discriminator to tell the difference between one and the other. And, um, and in the end, it gets really good at telling the difference between a real image and these crummy things that our generator is making. Um, and then the, the neat thing is that becomes a function uh, that scores realism. And we can use that function as an objective for our generator to beat now. right? So, so the green thing is the, the uh, oops, we're still on my, so we're here. Okay, so the green thing is uh, the, the classifier that we just trained. And, um, uh, and so the yellow thing is the generator that we want to train. But now we know how to make the generator better. The idea is just train the generator to fool the discriminator. So, uh, so you do that, and you can kind of get images that look a lot better. 
uh, but still not very realistic. And so the problem is that the generator can only learn the details that the discriminator is looking for. So if you train a discriminator to tell the difference between a really crummy generator and a real image, then it doesn't have to look for much. It can look for the presence of a blue sky or something like that, um, but it doesn't need to pay attention to a lot of the other details in the image. So, but we can make the discriminator better by now training it further to tell the difference between these better fakes and real images, which will force the discriminator to pay attention to more details. And if we turn it back to the other side, then the generator will uh, have a better loss function that allows it to learn these details and beat the discriminator again. So basically, it's, it's, the, you know, it's this game of, um, of uh, uh, you know, pitting two neural networks against each other to get them to solve a problem where we actually don't know what the right solution of the problem is. In, in, in fighting against each other, they eventually get to be very good on one side at detecting uh, the difference between a fake image and a real image. And on the other side, the generator gets very good at making very realistic looking images that are very hard to tell whether they're fake or not. Um, so the techniques for doing this, there's a lot of other tricks to do this. The techniques of doing, for doing this have gotten better and better. And we're at the point now where for some classes of images, like faces, um, we can get really almost indistinguishable photorealistic images out of a generator just from playing this game against an adversarial discriminator. And uh, for other classes, so this is, um, this is uh, these are all images that were generated from a generator that was trained on the Elson Church data set. And when I show this to people and I explain to them that I'm tra training on churches, they, a lot of people think, oh, these are, these are training images, but they're not. These are images that, are, that were just uh, synthesized by a generator, given a random number to start with. Uh, the generator just outputs one of these random images. Uh, and they look pretty credible. They look like um, you know, pretty realistic scenes. Not only did it learn how to uh, draw a bunch of different styles of churches, but the styles are pretty self-consistent with, you know, with types of windows and doors that are sort of in the right place and sort of a right style. And, and a lot of other details in the scenes, like vegetation, you know, trees, you know, walking paths, and things like that, are all, all in the right place. Um, and so, so here's a puzzle. So the question is, you know, we, we really want to know what the heck this thing learned, right? Um, there's a couple different strategies you could imagine that the GAN, that the GAN generator might have learned uh, to solve this problem. So like if you, were, um, if you were a computer programmer on a deadline, then the easiest strategy that you might program would be memorization. You know, somehow take a peek at the training set and just memorize all those images. And then now your job is to make a program that makes a realistic image. So you just go back into your hash table and, uh, and reproduce one of the images. And since you're not supposed to exactly reproduce them, maybe come up with some clever algorithm for messing it up a little bit so you can't be detected, right? So maybe that's what uh, the generator doing, is doing. Maybe it's just memorizing. Um, it'd be kind of like, uh, you know, taking a peek at the answers for a test and memorizing that. Uh, you know, when you memorize something, you can do a lot, but it doesn't really mean that you know anything, that you really understand the structure of the problem. So if you, but now that's very different from like how a human would solve this problem. If you asked uh, an artist to generate an image, they wouldn't do it completely from memory. They actually would make a decision about the structure of what they want to produce. They might say, well, I think that the weather should be uh, cloudy, and they'll put some clouds in the sky, and then on top of that, they might uh, choose an architectural style for the building and deal with that separately, and then decide what the vegetation should be. And they know what a tree is, and they know what a building is, and a door, and a window, and clouds in the sky, and things like they know what an object is, and they know how an object looks. So, so this is kind of a puzzle. Is, is the network uh, working compositionally? Is it, has it actually learned some structure about the world? Um, or is it just memorizing, where it's just reproducing pixels that it's seeing without any understanding of uh, what the structure of those pixels is um, and what, what the purpose of them is? And so, so how do we answer this question? Um, it's, actually, um, uh, it's actually an old question. Um, and uh, what, we're, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a method that's inspired by um, methods in neuroscience um, 
uh, that, uh, that you know, people have used for a long time to try to answer the question for how human brains work. Um, and so inspired by that, we sort of call it neck dissection because what we're going to do is we're going to cut open the network and we're going to look at everything inside. We'll, we'll do the thing that neuroscientists aren't able to do with human brains because, uh, because we have no ethical concerns with uh, artificial neural networks. Um, and so been a, it's been a fun project to be able to do all these things. And so here's my collaborators. Uh, and uh, and it's, um, we found some interesting things I'll share. Okay, so what is the method? The method's very simple. Uh, we'll take the GAN generator, which uh, seems to be able to do these amazing things, and we'll just run it. So to run it, you give it a random number, and then it does all these computations, which we don't understand, uh, but that it's learned over you know, many millions of training iterations, and then it outputs an image. So we want to know what happens at one of these computations. So each one of the computations outputs just a bunch of numbers. Uh, the numbers are, in, there, it's a convolutional net, so the numbers are arranged in these grids, um, like this. And, um, and so I've drawn these little heat maps, sort of suggesting where, you know, where in the grid the numbers are bigger or smaller. So we can collect all these things. And so the output of any layer of any step of the network is actually a set of convolutional filter outputs. So a set of grids of numbers. Uh, so conv each convolutional filter output is like a heat map uh, that you can lay over the image. Uh, and, and each step of the computation gives you hundreds of these heat maps. Uh, and those are fed into the next step of the computation. So we'll, I'm going to call uh, each of these heat maps you know, a channel or a unit or a set of activations. Um, and, so, um, and so you can think of each heat map as, uh, as, like, a, as like a neuron. Um, okay, so then, uh, then what we'll do is we'll take one of these channels out, one of these neurons, and we're going to ask the question, what is it doing? What's it for? Right? Okay, so how do we ask what's it for? What we'll do is this. We're going to ask if if we can understand what it's for in a human understandable way. So what the neuroscientists who study this in the human brain do is they come up with all sorts of theories. Like maybe, uh, maybe you've got neurons that are looking for snakes, or maybe you've got ones looking for human faces, and so on. So they just look for correlations to see if um, over a large set of images or different situations, your set of neurons that they're testing in the human brain uh, you know, correlate with faces or other things. And they found that there's a few classes of things that, uh, that you do have specific uh, sets of neurons for. So we're going to do the same thing here. We can do it a little bit better because we can actually look at each individual neuron one at a time. And, uh, and so we can look at things in a lot more fine-grained detail. So what we do is we just generate the image. And then we take a look at one of these heat maps. And then we lay the heat map on top of the image. And so on the upper right-hand corner is just a rendering of what it looks like when we do that. So what I've done is I've masked out all the places in the image where the, where the uh, neuron is just not firing very strongly. And I've let the image show through where the neuron is firing very strongly. The, uh, the convolutional filter output is a different resolution for the image, but that's not a problem. Uh, we just upsample it. Um, uh, the, uh, the receptive field for each one of these neurons, like the part of the image that each one of them impacts, uh, is really the part of the image that is directly underneath uh, that large feature pixel. So we just upsample it so that you can see what part of the image that, that neuron is impacting the most. And so when we do this, we can, we can see these patterns. We can look at an image and we can say, well, what is there? What's in that part of the image where these neurons are firing the strongest? And it, it, you, you can look at it by hand. And this one looks like, hmm, looks like it's trees or vegetation or maybe vertical things. We're not quite sure. But what we do is this. We're, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, make a dictionary of hundreds and hundreds of different possible candidate concepts that uh, we think that neurons might be responsible for. And we're going to score each one of those concepts against each one of the neurons. So how do we do this at scale and automatically? Well, we can take an, a network that was trained to segment images uh, and you know, basically to tell us what type of object or what type of color or texture or whatever is at, at every pixel of the image. And, um, and so if we ask a network, tell us where all the tree pixels are, it might come up with some rough guess of where all the tree pixels are. And then we can ask, does this neuron that we don't know what it does, does it correlate with the tree output of a trained segmentation network? 
So what we're doing is we're taking neurons that were trained completely unsupervised, where we don't know what they, what they do or what their purpose might be, and we're asking the question, do they match uh, neurons or outputs of a neural network that we trained uh, on a difficult supervised problem with lots of human labels and supervision? Uh, so we're sort of asking, can you learn something, you know, do, do these networks learn something for free that we never told it? Um, by comparing them to a network that where we told the network a lot of things, okay? So, uh, so when we do this, uh, what do we find? Well, we actually find a lot of interesting structure. So here's the example of the, the um, neural network that was trained on churches. And um, uh, what I've done here is I've visualized uh, what you get if you just generate a thousand random churches and you ask the question, which image causes this neuron, this convolutional filter, to fire the strongest? And which is the second strongest? So these are the top uh, seven images out of a thousand that cause a certain filter to fire the strongest. And then within each image, I've highlighted where in the image that filter is uh, firing strongly. And you can see that there's an image that seems to light up whenever a tree shows up. And then there's another, Im uh, um, there's another neuron that lights up whenever domes are drawn in the image and so on. There's a lot of these types of neurons. So there, there does seem to be structure. This doesn't look like an opaque memorization scheme. It's very suggestive that there's some structure being learned by the neural network um, that roughly matches the way that humans might look at a scene. It's pretty interesting. Uh, it, this happens on a variety of different models. Uh, when you train them, this is a model that was trained to generate uh, dining rooms. And uh, you get neurons, obviously, they don't do different things. You don't get a lot of trees in dining rooms, but you get other types of objects. So you get different types of structure that are found in, in the network. Here we have a neuron that is correlated with uh, windows, another one correlated with tables. And so there's an interesting point here, right? Because, um, because if you look at like the output of the network when this table neuron lights up, you realize that there's a lot of visual diversity here. Right, the neuron isn't just coding for a color um, or a particular texture, because if you look at the different types of tables that show up, they look quite different, right? They're like different colors, they're different levels of clutter, uh, they, you know, they're in different sort of contexts and orientations and so on. And, um, uh, and so it's really not encoding for a particular set of pixels or a specific concrete pixel pattern. Um, it's, it's interesting. It's like, what is it coding for? The only thing that you can think of looking at this is really just coding for a table. Um, and so we see this a lot um, in the network. We see this to uh, a surprising extent uh, more than we expected to when we, when we looked at these state-of-the-art generative networks. Um, and so that's, that's really the first surprise, is that we found any generalizable high-level structure at all. There's a second surprise, which is where in the network we found it. So, um, so what I've done here is I've, I've laid out um, you know, most of the layers of a neural network that was trained uh, adversarially to generate living room images. And in this bar graph, each one of the little bars represents a different concept that matches with some neurons. And the height of the little bar, which is horizontal here, counts how many neurons match that same concept. And then I've stacked up all the concepts vertically, and I've color-coded the concepts. So the dark blue things are objects, um, like trees or windows. And, the, um, and then the light blue things are parts of objects, like the top of a sofa, the bottom of a chair, right, that kind of thing, right, the top of a window. And in, in orange, we have uh, materials, like wood or uh, concrete or something like that. And, um, and so you can, you can see um, that as you go through the network, as you get, so what the, the structure of this network is random numbers come in on the left, a whole bunch of different computation happens, and then images come out on the right-hand side here. And, um, and so on the right-hand side, you, you get very few object neurons, uh, mostly for um, very textural things like painted walls or carpet. Um, but mostly the neurons are selecting for low-level features like materials or things that we don't have in our dictionary, like edges at a certain angle or things like that. And so, um, 
Uh, so, and, then, and then on the very left-hand side, we see very little structure. There's very little, uh, there's very few uh, channels that strongly correlate with any concepts at all. So the, the surprise here is that the structure seems to happen in the middle, uh, that a lot of convolutional filters in the middle and the middle layers of the network uh, actually correlate very well with high-level human understandable concepts. So this was a surprise. I think this is something that wasn't generally understood before we, we took a look at this, uh, this effect. Um, but for some reason, these networks are actually disentangling a lot of the information uh, that they're learning and exposing them as individual convolutional channels. And so... Um, okay, so that's very suggestive. Um, and so if we're neuroscientists, then we might be done. Um, but the problem is that a correlation doesn't actually imply causation. So just because a neuron correlates with trees doesn't mean that that's really how the network is thinking about trees. Like, what does that mean for a network to be thinking about trees? Or, right, it means that like, we wanna, what we really want to know is what is the neuron for? Right? Does the neuron actually cause the network to do something about trees, like render a tree or something like that? And so when neuroscientists have this problem, uh, what they wish they could do is they wish they could like stick a probe into your brain and stimulate it and then ask you, what do you see, right? And once in a while, there's like an epilepsy patient that, you know, actually has probes in their brains and they sign a, you know, release and you can do this. And it's amazing to see these experiments, right? They, you know, the people will say, oh, I see a face or something like that. It's amazing. So the neat thing is that that's what the AGAN's job is. AGAN always tells us what it sees. Its job is to render images. So let's do this. Let's like go into the network and we'll intervene in it. We'll say, we know this, this neuron normally fires at a certain level or whatever, but we're going to change it. We're going to ask the what if question. We'll say, what if these neurons fired strongly? Or what if these neurons fired at zero? It's like stopping a program in the middle with a debugger and just changing a variable and seeing what it does. And that's you know, it's basically what we do. Um, and so it turns out that when you do this, you, do, you obviously have an effect on the image. And the question is, do we have the causal effect that we expect to see? Uh, so if we take a set of units that correlate with trees and we force them on, we're going to see some change in the image. And so we can quantify that by seeing like how, how the trees are actually affected. Do we get more tree pixels in the image? Or if we turn it off, we can quantify, do we get fewer tree pixels in the image? And it turns out that we do, that we get quite strong causal effects. We take, if we take five or 10 units that correlate with trees, and we force them off, then the trees disappear from the images. And you can, you can kind of see this effect right here. Um, you know, what happens when you zero out some units or zero out a few more units? And the interesting thing is it really seems to turn off the trees without turning off other things in the image. The buildings are still there. In fact, when we turn off the trees, we can see buildings that are present that weren't visible in the image before. Um, that it's sort of like an occlusion effect. Um, and uh, and as, we, as we zero out more of the tree units, more of the um, non-tree parts of the images become visible. And so this is really interesting. Um, and uh, you know, we, we built this model to, uh, we built this um, uh, tool to allow us to uh, intervene with units to see you know, what they're doing. And it turned out to be so fun that we, um, we put it online and we made a little demo that you can play with. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you Google for uh, GAN dissect online, which is the name of our, our, our paper that came out uh, with this work, there's a little uh, demo um, under an icon that you can click and it'll work on, work on your laptop. And so, uh, so yeah, so if you turn on neurons for trees or domes or whatever, then a dome will appear or a tree will appear. If you turn off neurons, then they'll disappear. And I can actually, maybe if I can flip, can I flip to my laptop? Will this work? Oh, I'm unplugged here. This, it won't work if I'm not plugged in. Okay. So uh, there's this, a certain um, effect that I want to show. And maybe if I can flip over, if it'll work. If not, then I'll, oh, yeah, it's great. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, so let's, let's, uh, let's draw some extra trees in this image. So, um, so if you, yeah, if you just sort of draw over there, right, you can see that uh, when it draws, so I'm not steering it, uh, you know, our helpful AV guy is drawing, and so uh, these are not curated drawings. Um, 
And you can see when it does this, it, 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 it generally knows how to draw a tree. It uh, you know, puts a, a tree trunk in the right place. It makes it look pretty realistic. But the interesting thing about this image is what happens if we remove uh, the trees. So let's flip over to remove mode and let's remove some of these trees here. Right? And so, uh, so you can see that when, when you do that, it doesn't just like, you know, result in some distorted effect. Um, uh, let's remove, let's go ahead and we, we'll remove all the trees in the image. Yep, no fear. Okay, good. Let's remove them. Okay, great. So now when you do this, look at what happened here. There's this, there's this beautiful church sitting there behind the trees. Like the neural network did all this work to make a plan to draw this church that it didn't need to do. If, if, if all it was going to do is reproduce some image by just reproducing some pixels, it didn't need to come up with a plan for what would have happened if there hadn't been a tree here. But somehow that plan is encoded in the neural network's computations. It's doing more work than it needed to, which to me is pretty uh, suggestive that uh, the network is working compositionally. Um. It's thinking about the buildings and the trees and other things separately. There's another effect uh, in here um, that we can show if you select the door um, concept and then let's say draw doors. And I haven't tried it on this image, but go ahead and draw some doors all over the, all over the church. Yeah, so, so you can, we can make, you know, sort of door-like structures all over the place. But now, yes, that's great. And we can even draw like doors, you know, create a little building here. But now if you go into an area of the blue sky and then draw a door there, right, it's going to really not do much. It's, it, look at this. So like, it doesn't really draw doors in the sky. It, draw, it knows how to draw doors in buildings and not in skies. Um, let's flip to another one of the images, like one of the uh, red brick buildings, maybe the f one f further to the right. Uh, that's a great one, yeah. And let, let draw, draw doors all the heck all over the place here. You can kind of see. So the other thing, interesting thing is that you get different types of doors in different contexts. Um, you know, you get different styles of things. Uh, but again, you know, doors in the sky don't work, so you can try that. And, and, um, and you know, it's, it's quite sensitive to the context. So it's, it's interesting. Up here in the corner, you can see some slight artifacts where uh, you're able to cause some problems in the corner. And actually, this is something that, uh, that we found that these convolutional GANs, they're very sensitive to structure. They, they'll prevent you from drawing an object in the wrong context in most places, but in the corners they're a little bit dumb. They don't know how to enforce the rules in the corners, so you can get a lot of artifacts to happen in the corners. Um, and so, um, uh, but yes, so not only have they like divided up the scene in these ways, but they seem to have learned um, some relationships between objects. So I'm going to go back to the slide deck here, and um, so go ahead and go on to the next, next slide. Okay, that's great. And so, um, so this is, yeah, these are just examples of different doors in different images in different contexts. And you can see we, like, each one of these does exactly the same intervention, turns on exactly the same set of neurons, but depending on the context, we get a bigger door or a smaller door or a door of a different color or so on. And this, this bar chart uh, quantifies the causal effect of turning on a door neuron in different contexts. If we turn on a door where there's already a brick wall or a window or a building, then it has this very strong effect on the images. And if we turn on a door where there's a sky or a tree, then the effect is much, much, much smaller. Um, and so, so, you know, with our methods, you know, you can, you can quantify all this stuff and start to read out some of the structure that's being learned by the network. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, that's great. Oh yeah, this is the, um, uh, this is a little bit of the demo here. Okay. All right, so there's a couple other things here. How, how am I doing on time? Doing okay? So, um, so there's a couple things that you can do with this that are pretty interesting. So one of the questions is, um, can you actually use this knowledge to improve generative networks at all? And one of the problems that generative networks have is that as good as they are, once in a while, they still output really bad looking images like the images on the right here. So this is a model that was trained to generate images of bedrooms. And uh, in the upper right hand corner are some of the um, bad, bad images that was produced. So it's the same model that was uh, making these sort of beautiful churches 
and things like that. Um, but, uh, but they create these artifacts. So our question was, can we actually explain what these artifacts are doing? So what we did is we did exactly the same thing that we did with um, understanding if, how trees are, are drawn or how doors are drawn. We ran the network. We looked for neurons that correlate with these artifacts, and we found a bunch, which are neurons like the, whose highest uh, activations are shown on the left here. So we, we found about a dozen neurons that correlate with these artifacts. And then we did interventions. And so the obvious intervention for these is what happens if we just turn those neurons off? And on these images, you go to these you know, dozen or so neurons, and you turn them off, and you have this causal effect on the images. It actually removes a bunch of the artifacts. So to us, this was really surprising that you can do this. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, so, that's, uh, so that's one of the applications of, of this approach. And, uh, and another application is drawing. And so the, the, general, the general story um, that I, I want to communicate, or I want you to walk away with, is that when we train networks uh, with a lot of hidden layers, uh, they learn things that we don't explicitly teach them. They, learn, they can learn non-trivial things. And, um, and it really behooves us to go in and try to understand what it is that they're learning. Some of the things will be a surprise. Some of the things will uh, reveal that the networks have learned non-trivial things that, uh, that are great. And other things will reveal that the network has uh, continued to be dumb on other things, like the way that we can see that these networks are dumb in the corner. Um, or there are certain concepts uh, that we can see that the network doesn't understand the context for. So I didn't demo like grass or so on, but like these networks think that grass can belong anywhere in an image, for example, right? Um, and so, but now there's this other thing that you can do, right? You can ask this question, what did networks not learn? And we can also look at this in a serious way. Uh, so this is, this is another um, piece of work that's, that's ongoing that uh, takes a similar structured approach but instead of asking what's going on inside the network, we're kind of asking what's going on outside. What, what is it that, what's, what's like the inverse of what the network can do? So uh, one of the problems that GANs have is they suffer from this problem called uh, mode collapse or mode dropping, where there are uh, common types of images uh, that are in the output distribution but that the GAN either refuses to generate those types of images, or um, a GAN will sometimes take one type of image and learn how to generate it and generate it and like nothing else. So, so if, it, if it picks one mode that it really loves, it's called mode collapse. If it picks one type of image that it doesn't really want to generate, it's called mode dropping. And um, uh, there are two sides of the same coin. And a lot of work has been done on combating mode collapse and, and getting GANs to really learn the real diversity of images that they produce. And it's, and it's gotten quite good now. And, um, and uh, people feel pretty confident in uh, GANs' ability to do diverse things. Um, but the, the, the thing that um, we don't really have a tool for, or we didn't really have a tool for, or we need one, is to understand like, as good as GANs have gotten, what are they still unable to do? And so what, what we did here is this, and I'll just give you a quick overview. Um, so you can actually catalog what a GAN does by just looking at examples. But looking at examples is not going to tell you what a GAN doesn't do. To see what a GAN doesn't do, you just have to count carefully. So, uh, so what we do is we take the training set, and we carefully count all the pixels of all the different types of objects that appear in an image. So if a person appears in an image in a certain number of pixels, we'll just count it up. And we put all these different types of, and we'll put it in a bar. And if a uh, you know, building or a sky or a tree or whatever uh, appears in an image, we'll count them up. And those, those bars show up as this histogram on the top. This blue bar histogram is what the training set has in terms of the different types of uh, objects that it produces or that, that it contains uh, inside it. And then you can go to a GANs output, and you can do the same thing. So we take a high-quality GAN like this one, and, uh, and we count automatically what it's producing. And you can see it actually follows the line pretty closely. But where it doesn't, where it deviates, you can see what it is that the GAN it, you know, doesn't know or what it's overemphasizing. And so this GAN, for example, um, is not drawing enough people. It's drawing too many things uh, that we would call Earth and so on. And so, uh, 
so then you're left with this question, what does it mean that the GAN can't draw people? And so the example is on the right here. So what we did is we developed this method to give us an example. How do we find an example where a GAN should be like drawing a person, but it's not? Yep, so to do this, what we do is we take a GAN generator and we uh, train an inverter algorithm that finds the best random input, the best uh, you know, internal computation that the GAN can do uh, to produce an image like the one that we want. Right? And then, so the result of this is shown up here on top. So we start off with an image of like this church with this uh, girl in a, in a purple sweater in front of it. And we say, what is the computation that the GAN can do to produce an image most like this one? And then we get the image on the right. And so now this gives us a really nice pair of what we want the GAN to do and what the GAN is capable of doing. And the, the, the fascinating thing is that when we do that, we can see that the GAN has really successfully been able to make a really realistic image while still skipping out on a certain hard part of the problem without being detected by a discriminator. Right? So the image on the right looks perfectly realistic, looks like a great image of a church. It's missing a person. And so when the GAN says, I'm not going to draw a person, it like, skips it cleanly uh, and, and does it in a way that you really wouldn't be able to detect from looking at, uh, looking at the example. So this is another lesson, which is, um, you know, when you want to understand what your networks aren't doing, it's not just enough to look at examples of what they are doing, because they can learn to, be, they can learn to hide their failures from you uh, and do something that seems quite reasonable, while, while actually they could be a large part of the problem that they are, they're skipping. So, um, so, that's, so that's the takeaway, is that these networks are, um, they have a lot of interesting structure in them, not only in what they're computing, but there's also potentially a lot of interesting structure in what they're not computing. And, um, uh, and so, these are, so developing these new types of debugging techniques is something that our community should be doing more of. Uh, I think that we tend to focus a lot on bottom line performance, but, um, but just like you know, not everything in the world is you know, how fast your database runs or you know, what the features of your product are, um, a, lot, a lot of what we should be focusing on is how to debug networks, how to understand in detail what their behavior is uh, and what their behavior, what the gap is between what they are doing and what they should be doing. So anyway, that's, that's, my, um, that's my talk for today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions.